we live in quite a world. The Hebrew prophet Isaiah warned of those who call good evil and evil good. This is a problem and it's becoming a worse problem. It's always been a problem, but remember in the last days things that were always problematic become accelerated. They take on an added dimension. About two and a half months ago, this is the Irish Times newspaper. It's the main newspaper of the Republic of Ireland. This is two and a half months old. And I'll just read what it says. Church routinely covered up child sex abuse for 30 years. Report says priority of diocese was institution, not children. Now let me just read you one thing. Church authorities use the concept of mental reservation, which allows senior clergy to mislead people without being guilty in the church's eyes of lying. In other words, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that it's permissible to mislead the police, to mislead authorities, in order to protect the pedophile who's molesting children. And it's not a sin as long as the pedophile you're protecting is a nun or a priest. That's their teaching. That's how they justified it. It's documented. It was uncovered in their own documents. It was proven. This is the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It is not a sin to lie to protect child molesters, providing the child molesters you're protecting is a nun or a priest. People in Ireland are shocked. As rightly they should be. But I guarantee you, many of them, less and less, and fewer and fewer young people, but many of them will still go to Mass. <laughs> now, logically, nobody could defend this. Logically, nobody could conceivably issue a defense for something so atrocious and so wicked. But it doesn't matter. You still do it. And I can show similar headlines about the teachings of Islam. Yet when you do so, if you do so, you will be called guilty of hate speech. Hate speech. And a time will come when they will say that a pastor who will stand up and show people that is guilty of hate speech. Your church is no longer tax deductible. That's what it's coming to. And there's plenty of politicians, Democrat and Republican, all of them going to hell who do these kind of things, who will go along with it. All of them. Hate speech. We give a different definition to words. Tolerance means to tolerate. I am willing to tolerate somebody's right to be a homosexual or a lesbian if they're mutual consenting adults. I'm willing to tolerate their right to do that. But that's not enough. If you don't agree that it's right and natural, and they should have the rights to legally marry and adopt children and artificially inseminate and so forth, now you're guilty of hate speech. Tolerance no longer means to tolerate. It means you have to affirm. Even if it's Islam, a religion itself which is intolerant, which is dogmatically intolerant. They can't show you a single Muslim country with Islamic law that's tolerant. If you are not willing, not simply to tolerate the intolerant, but to believe an obvious lie, that it is tolerant when it isn't, now you're guilty of hate speech. And of course the media, the school systems, teachers unions, left-wing academics, and above all, politicians will support it. You're guilty of hate speech. It's not enough that you're willing to tolerate their right to do it or believe it. If you don't affirm it as good, right. you're intolerant. <laughs> You've committed hate speech. They've redefined tolerance. 
The world is getting more and more like that. But that's the world. My problem is the church is getting more and more like that. And I would even go further. I would propose that if the church was not becoming more and more like that, either would society and the world. Just look how much Muslims will be up in arms if you say anything about Islam. They'll be filing lawsuits and Christians won't do that. Some will. Yesterday, the day before yesterday, the pop singer in England, Elton John, said Jesus Christ was a, was a homosexual. <laughs> he had no basis to say it other than, you know. <sighs> I can say this was wrong. I can say it offends my beliefs in Jesus as a Christian to say that about Jesus, about my Savior. It offends my... Now, now I'm intolerant. <laughs> he can insult my faith, your faith. He can insult Jesus Christ. But if we say he's insulted, we're intolerant. He's the victim now. And you know, the media will go along with it. They'll go along with it. And this is getting worse. You know, he runs the biggest AIDS charity in Great Britain. We will not take one penny from him because of his moral stance. Even though the ravens fed Elijah. Let the ravens feed Elijah. I don't mind taking, if, let's say we, we get contributions from corporations for the, for the uh, surgically implanted esophagus. I'll take that. But they're not blaspheming Jesus. Right. Let the ravens feed Elijah. But this is blasphemer. Yeah. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 is a verse I pointed to many times that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. Biblically, scripturally, God says love, agape love, cannot abound unless there is knowledge of scripture and discernment. You can have some emotionally charged stupidity that people in their ignorance imagine to be love abounding, but you cannot have love abounding. Love as God defines it. I once heard a Catholic woman who claimed to be born again whenever she was confronted by ex-Catholics with doctrinal realities her response was the Apostle John, all he kept saying was love one another, love one another. In her ridiculous mind love and truth were mutually exclusive. If you love, you don't worry about what people believe. Because Jesus loved, he very much worried about what people believed. Yes. We saw this with the woman at the well. You know that not of what you speak. Yes. We saw this with the Syrophoenician woman. I can't give the children's bread to dogs. Your religion is not fit for human consumption. Because he loved people, he was very concerned with what they believe. Yes, John wrote much about love. In 1st John chapter 4 verse 7 he wrote this Beloved let us love one another in verse 7 for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God that's what he says then he goes on verse 11 beloved if God so loved us we ought to love one another Verse 17, by this love is perfected with us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. That's all true. Love, 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 love. But then when you get to chapter 5, verse 2, verses 1 and 2, he begins to say what the love is. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe his commandments. 
Jesus said in John's Gospel, if you love me, keep my commandments. They are saying, or many are saying, don't worry about the things the scripture commands, just love. Well, the scripture says if you're not intent on doing what's commanded, you don't love. With these things in view, turn with me to 2 John. 2 John is a rather personal epistle written by John, and it was probably written on a standard size of papyrus, 10 by 8, a short letter. We don't know if it was written to a church or to a literal person, but notice he defines himself simply as the elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. This epistle focuses on love in its openings, but before it talks about love, notice it talks about truth. If there's not truth, there's not love. For the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Notice it puts truth before love. If the truth is not there, the love is not there. Now, it's possible, it's possible to have truth without love. It is possible to have truth without love. It is not possible, however, to have love without truth. <laughs> I've seen people in Northern Ireland, conservative evangelical Protestants, they confuse sometimes being anti-Roman Catholicism with being anti-Roman Catholic. Right. I am 110 percent anti-Roman Catholicism. This is a religion of Satan. This is of the devil. I am totally anti-Roman Catholicism. But one of the reasons I am against Catholicism is because I am pro-Catholics. I want Catholics to know the truth. Therefore, they must be told the truth about the Catholicism that does this to their children. And dares to call it Christian. Well, these people in Northern Ireland, everything they say about the Roman Catholic Church is true. Everything they say about the Pope is true. The problem is they don't speak the truth in love. They speak of love with an antagonism not against Catholicism, but with an antagonism against Catholics. You can have truth without love, but you cannot have love without truth. If people believe fundamentally false doctrine, it's not love. It's garbage. But let's read. I'm very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. And now I ask you, lady, not as writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have from the beginning, that we love one another. In the first four verses, he keeps reiterating the importance of truth. Only once truth is firmly, firmly established as the foundation does he say, now what are we going to do with this truth? This truth should propel us to love. We have the true gospel. We have the truth about salvation. We have the true way of redemption. We have the true message of Jesus. We have the truth. But what good is it if we don't love the people who don't have it. <laughs> and this love that we walk according, to, and this is love in verse 6, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. Notice he says, love one another. What is this love? walking in his commandments. People who do not act on the truth, people who do not live in accordance with the truth, people who do not put the truth into practical operation to help others, 
don't love. What is this love? That we walk according to his commandments. He commanded us to preach the gospel. He commanded it. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. Now look what he says. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you might not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in this teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Having many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. Rather short, but he opens by reiterating love depends on truth. Truth, 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 truth. Then he says, love, love, love. But then he says what the love is. The same as the secular world in the age of political correctness has redefined tolerance, so many Christians have defined love by their own definition. We see this in the ecumenical movement. In the name of so-called love, you abandon the truth. You don't deal with the reality of this wicked institution of Satan, the Church of Rome. No, if you do that, you don't love. They say. If you don't address this, you don't love. What about those kids? <laughs> what about those kids? You don't love. You're an unloving person. It's all hypocrisy. Now notice something. Many deceivers have gone into the world who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ. Even when some of the apostles were still alive, it began. Throughout the pre-Nicene age, this was the issue. With the church fathers, this was the issue. But it began even when the apostles were still alive. What was the issue? People had a false Christology. They believed and they tried to teach others to believe false things about Jesus. Many, many deceivers have gone into the world. Those who did not acknowledge the Lord Jesus as coming in the flesh, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses say he didn't literally raise from the dead. That was his ghost. They deny it. This was called docetism. There were people in the early church saying when he walked down the beach he didn't really leave footprints in the sand. He only looked at... Jehovah's Witnesses will say the same thing today. New Ages will say the same thing today. It's the cosmic Christ that's the real one. Jesus was just the man who was... A... He was not the Word incarnate, he was just somebody who was a teacher who pointed to the cosmic Christ. And that's what New Ages will say. These things are not new. But it says, many have gone into the world who do not acknowledge Jesus. Notice they've gone into the world. They're looking for converts. But then John says in verse 8, watch yourselves that you might not lose what we have accomplished. In other words, the teachings of the apostles. When you begin to accommodate, when you begin to give place to people, 
who have a false Christology, a false doctrine about Jesus, you will lose the teaching of the apostles. You will lose the teaching of the apostles. I responded to somebody today by email, I was going back and forth about the Pelagianism, and I showed him yesterday, look, it says we are sinners by nature. I showed him the Greek word nature, what it meant, and the way it's used in the New Testament. All of a sudden, he's a Greek scholar. Now he's going to correct my Greek. I suppose he tried to correct my Hebrew as well. Now, obviously, he doesn't know Greek himself. Somebody probably told him this, I imagine. But he said something completely ridiculous about what the Greek says. No, nature is acquired. If it was acquired, it's not what you are by nature. Making absurd statements. I said, look, it's the same word in Romans 11. The natural branches are what they are by nature. The wild branches, a branch from an olive tree can't determine its nature. It didn't practice or do anything to acquire its own nature. But the real issue is not what the Greek means. The real issue is defending a lie about Jesus. Denying that he is who and what the Word of God says he is. Begotten of the Father, not of the son of Adam. He's the last Adam. Watch yourselves. Look out for this. They all do it. The Sabalians, the Jesus-only people, the Mormons, the Church of Rome with the Eucharistic Christ, the Mormons with the, <laughs> the Latter-day Saints Christ, who's the spirit brother of Satan, the Jehovah's Witness, whose Christ is Michael the Archangel, he's not, <laughs> who didn't raise from the dead. Oh, they all say Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ said, many will come in my name. <laughs> have the same name as if it's a different Jesus. My Jesus isn't a piece of bread or a cup of wine. My Jesus is not the spirit brother of Satan. That's right. My Jesus did leave footprints when he walked on the beach. Yeah. They have a different Jesus. But somehow, in the name of love, John was enlightened by the Holy Spirit to foresee a danger where in the name of love, truth would be compromised. <laughs> Nearly 2,000 years ago, John saw this danger, where in the name of love, truth would be compromised so that deceivers would be able to wreak havoc. Right. <laughs> this man goes on to tell me, sin is using for evil that which is good. <laughs> Now, there's two words for sin in Greek, hamartino, hamartino, in Hebrew there's two words for sin. Chet and pesha. We're also told there's sins of barut, sins of ignorance. People who do things they don't even know is wrong. Right. <laughs> but it's still wrong, and Christ had to die for it. But he said, any, he said, no, no, that's not... They make up ridiculous things that directly contradict the scripture. And when you show them it, it doesn't matter. Anyone who goes too far. Now this, in Hebrew, would not be missing the mark. It would be going too far. It would be pesha. Okay? In, in, in Hebrew. In Greek, you know, hamartino, hamartino. It's a sin of commission. Not where you fail to do something you should, but went beyond and did something you shouldn't. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in, in the teaching of Christ does not have God, the one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. Notice this. People who go beyond what the scripture says about Jesus and assign their own meanings have gone too far. It is first of all Sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6. That you may learn not to exceed the things which are written. Amen. None of these cults can exist unless they exceed what's written. Right. 
Where is it written? Where does the scriptures teach? Church authorities use the concept of mental reservation, which allows senior clergy to mislead people without being guilty in the church's eyes of lying. Where is permissible lying in order to protect sex criminals who molest children ever taught in the New Testament or the Old Testament? Where is that ever taught in scripture? Where? Roman Catholicism couldn't exist if it didn't do that, if they didn't go too far. <laughs> Mormonism couldn't exist if it didn't go too far. Jehovah's Witnesses couldn't exist if they didn't go too far. Pelagianism couldn't exist if it didn't go too far. Too far for who? They've gone too far for God. We can miss the mark, and we do. But when you go too far about the way of salvation, that it no longer can save, they do not abide in the teaching of Christ. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Now understand this. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, please. Verse 9. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with the moral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and idolaters or uh, the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters then you'd have to go out of the world in other words Paul is saying that we know that the world is filled with people like this but we have to witness to them anyway <laughs> you have to function in a fallen world but actually I wrote you not to associate with any so-called brother so-called brother if he should be immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Now the concept of eating had to do with, in the, in, the, in the context of the epistle, with the Lord's Supper. Okay? The Lord's Supper. Okay. Reviler is somebody who attacks someone personally instead of attacking what they do. <laughs> you mock with somebody who somebody is instead of what they are. <laughs> well, look at this. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. We should do nothing that would indicate to these people that we accept them as Christians. I don't accept Roman Catholic Church as Christian. Chuck Colson does. I don't accept Mormonism as Christian. Increasingly more and more Christians do, including so Jimmy Carter. I'm not even sure he's a Christian, if he ever was. I don't accept him. We should do nothing. When people do this, we should do nothing that would indicate to them we consider them to be a Christian if they persist in believing this, if they do not abide in the teachings of the Bible. Now it goes on to say, if we do, we participate in their evil deeds. If somebody goes to the Roman Catholic Church, in the eyes of Christ, they become co-guilty with these bishops who were lying to the police to protect sex criminals. You're going to mass, you're as guilty as they are. If we lead, lend any credence to these people who have a false Christology, who believe something false about Jesus, we become co-equally guilty because we are supposed to be upholding the standard. 
but they'll tell you, you don't love. You don't have any love for your brethren. I guess John didn't have any love for the brethren. Paul didn't have any love for the brethren. I think they did. I think they did. Now let's understand how this works. If somebody has a false Christology, they are going to be revealed to be an immorality at some point. Why? Christ is our righteousness. <laughs> if you don't have the real Christ, you don't have his righteousness. Now it's all the same. Islam claimed visions of angels. That Gabriel appeared to Muhammad in a cave. Catholics claim visions of angels and you know okay. Jehovah the Mormons, Joseph Smith claimed visions of angels. They all claimed that. Seventh day Adventists, Ellen G. White, they all claimed it. Well we know that you know you've you've got the, the, the polygamy of the Mormons. You've got the a lot of immorality in Jehovah's Witnesses. Talk to people saved out of it if you can meet any. They're interesting. They'll tell you how corrupt it really is. Islam, they have harems. Islam does not allow prostitution. No, it allows you to marry a woman for one night, a prostitute for one night, and then call it marriage, and then divorce her. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like the Catholics, would do the, they call the divorce annulment. Whenever you have people with a false Christology, with another Jesus, serious immorality is not going to be far in coming. Exactly. It will not be long in coming. Jesus is our righteousness. You are going to find them morally reprobate. Denying the biblical truth about Jesus is sin in itself. That kind of unbelief is sin in itself. Once that happens, moral reprobation is going to be inevitable. Mark my words, you'll find the people who do these things becoming morally reprobate. The Catholic Church has a Eucharistic Christology. What could be more morally reprobate? One could conceivably be more morally reprobate than saying it's not a sin to lie to protect pedophiles. As long as the pedophiles are priests and nuns, it's not a sin. What could be more reprobate? You know what the source of that is? The source of it is not what they believe about marriage or what they believe about sin or what they believe about sex. You know what the source of it is? What they don't believe about Jesus. <laughs> With Islam. It's not about jihad. It's not about terror. It's not about harems. It's not about sharia. It's not what they believe about those things. It's what they don't believe about Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses? <laughs> It's what they don't believe about Jesus. Orthodox Jews, it's what they don't believe about Jesus. If you don't believe the truth about Jesus, that other stuff's going to be automatic. That other stuff is going to happen anyway. What stops me from being like them? What stops you from being like them? What prevents us from doing the same stuff they do? Jesus. Exactly. It's not what we believe. It's who we believe. Amen. Who we believe. Once you believe him, then you believe what he said. <laughs> if you love me, keep my commandments. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. What we will believe will derive from who we believe. 
The key is not to believe the right thing. The key is to believe the right person. Amen. The key is to believe the right Christ, the right Jesus. Once you believe the right person, you'll keep his commandments. The focus is not on the doctrine, the focus is on the person. If you have the person right, you're going to have the doctrine right. Amen. But if you have the person wrong, the doctrine's going to be wrong. And if the doctrine's wrong, their moral standards are going to become depraved. <laughs> Once the doctrine goes off, mark my words, whenever you see somebody going off doctrinally, it's only a matter of time before they go off morally. When somebody begins to go off morally, you'll see they begin trying to justify it, playing around with the doctrine. <laughs> But it doesn't begin with either morality or doctrine. It begins with Jesus. It begins with Him. Look what John says. First he talks about truth in the opening verses. Then he talks about love in the middle verses. Then he talks about refuting heretics in the closing verses. But in all three sections of this short epistle, he predicates it all on the person of Christ. <laughs> when somebody believes something false, it's because they're not believing Jesus. When somebody does something wrong, it's because they're not listening to his commandments. As a result, of not listening to him. The focus is on the person. If the person is right, the doctrine will be right. If the doctrine is right, the relationship will be right. It all goes back to him, the relationship with him. Once that is wrong, once that goes off, once that happens, everything else collapses. Once you believe something false about him, that he's reincarnated as bread and wine, that he was not really physically resurrected or physically incarnate, that he, that he was a descendant of Adam, not the only the begotten of the Father, that he's the spirit brother of Satan. Once you believe something false about him, something like this becomes inevitable. This is not the cause, this is the effect. This is not the problem, this is the result of the problem. <laughs> if they had the real Jesus, they wouldn't have this. Exactly. If they had the real Jesus, they wouldn't have this. But they have this because they don't have the real Jesus. Many deceivers like this. Now look, they were around in the days of the apostles. Even then there was a lot of them, John says. Or the Holy Spirit says to, says to John. Even then there was a lot of them. But in these last days, there's a lot more. John's concern was these people getting into the church. Being tolerated. Being tolerated in the name of love. without people knowing what love is. God is love, John says. Jesus is God. Jesus is truth. Remember, Jesus didn't say, I'm going to tell you the truth or I know the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. He is truth incarnate. Amen. He is love incarnate. You get the person right, <laughs> the doctrine will be there. <laughs> Now this is not to say that a sincere believer cannot have errors in their doctrine. But if a true believer gets into some erroneous doctrine, if the relationship with Jesus is there, the Holy Spirit is going to show them and correct them. <laughs> Once they hear the truth and see it, they're going to get it right. Why? Not because some pastor straightened them out. That pastor is just an instrument. It's because of the relationship with Jesus they're going to get it right. It's always Him. It always depends on Him. 
This church is discernment aware. But it's very easy for churches like this one, and for people like you and I, for preachers like Pastor Randalls and myself, for ministries like Moriel, it's very easy for us to lose sight of something. We look for gaps in the doctrine. A physician looks for symptoms in order to diagnose the disease. He doesn't try to treat the symptoms primarily, he tries to treat the disease. Once you get rid of the disease, the symptoms will disappear. You have an infection, treat it with antibiotics, then the fever will go down. You can try to manage the fever with antipyretics or something like this, or paracetamol, you can do that, but that's not going to solve the problem what's causing the fever. <laughs> You've got to deal with the infection. It's so easy to look and blast the immorality. Well, the immorality is wrong, but it's not the main issue. As serious, as serious, as, consequ as consequential, and as utterly unspeakably reprehensible as this is, it's not the main issue. This is the symptom. It's not the disease. It's the effect. It's not the cause. It's the result of the problem. It's not the problem itself. We who are astute to these discernment issues need to be very careful. You don't want a doctor who treats symptoms for the sake of treating symptoms. You want a doctor who will treat symptoms, but more importantly, will diagnose the cause of the disease itself. <laughs> when this stuff happens, it's about their relationship with Jesus or their lack of it. They don't have the right Christ. They don't have the right understanding of the real Christ. That's what's happening in the church today. Now it's obvious that's the case of the Roman church, but that's always been obvious. It's obvious that's the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, but that's always been obvious. It's obvious it's the case of Mormons, but that's always been obvious. It's obvious that's the case of Pelagians, but it's always been obvious. What's not so obvious is when this stuff gets into the true church. The issue, the real issue, is not the effect, it's the cause. The real issue is not the symptom, it's the disease. The real issue, no matter how sad, how reprehensible these things may be, they're not the real issue. The real issue is, do they acknowledge the real Jesus? <laughs> if you had the real Jesus, you would have the real truth. If you had the real Jesus and you were taken in by an error, you would know it was an error before very long. In other words, this is what I see the danger for people like me. And I dare say for the people like you. We are very good at looking at the symptom. How good are we at looking at the disease? We're very good at noticing that doctrine is wrong, that doctrine is wrong, that, I'm pretty good at that. That doctrine, that's not right, that's wrong, that's wrong. I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> pretty good at that. But I'm less good at saying, where is that person's relationship with Jesus? <laughs> that's the real point. That's the real point. The reason being, because no matter how much truth I might have, if something goes off in my own relationship with Jesus, 
I can be easily seduced into going the same way. Let's be honest. Of all the televangelists, none of them had better doctrine than Jimmy Swaggart. His doctrine was right. Yeah. He was a traditional Pentecostal. His doctrine was right. Yeah. Can agree or disagree about secondary points, but his doctrine was right. His relationship with Jesus wasn't. Yeah. Now his doctrine is wrong. Because if his doctrine was right, he wouldn't be remaining in the ministry. <laughs> <laughs> see what I'm saying that's what I've got to look out for it's the relationship with Jesus with those people it's obvious <laughs> this as shocking as it is because it's shocking it makes it obvious it's obvious what you're dealing with with these Pelagian people who've reached some people in your church. For everything John said, these people get in here and they get in here to this church somehow and they got people in this church into it. But that's obvious. It's what's not obvious. That's the issue. The issue is not morality. The issue is not doctrine. Oh, those things are important, those things are vital, those things are crucial, but they're not the issue. The issue is, do we have the right relationship with the right Christ? Do we have the right relationship with the right Jesus? That's the issue. I can only speak for myself. Frankly, I know Paul said, let he who stands take heed lest he fall. But I don't think I'm going to be caught up in Pelagianism or Arianism or Docetism or anything like that. I don't think I'm going to wind up like a Mary Baker Eddy or something like that or an Ellen G. White. I don't think that's going to happen to me. But I would be a liar if I didn't say I'm just as capable of becoming a Jimmy Swaggart yeah. as Jimmy Swaggart. Yeah. I'm just as capable of being a Jimmy Swaggart as Jimmy Swaggart is. I'm just as capable. So are you. And this is love. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone into the world. Watch yourselves. Anyone who goes too far and doesn't abide in the teaching of Christ doesn't even have God. If anybody comes to you teaching something different, don't even let them in your house. Here these churches were meeting in houses. If anyone comes, doesn't bring this teaching, don't even let them in your house, don't even greet them because you'll be participating in what they do. Just like in Revelation, come out of her my people lest you share in her sins and partake in her place. The one who gives a greeting to these people participates in the evil deeds. Well, that's the warning for all of us. And I suppose it's a warning for each of us. But the real issue is this. If you love me, keep my commandments. It all comes down to one essential thing. Am I walking with Jesus? If I am, if you are, we are keeping his commandments. Otherwise, we can wind up just as far out there as the rest of them. Now I'll tell you why people are accommodating them. 
I'll tell you why people are going into ecumenical compromise and things like You know why? The fact that they're doing it, the Colsons and these people, that indicates there is something wrong with their own relationship with Jesus. You understand? If there was not something wrong with Chuck Colson's relationship with Jesus, he wouldn't be compromising with these people. <laughs> oh, he's a good brother. You're not loving. You're judging. If there was not something wrong with his own relationship with Jesus, he wouldn't be doing this. But his relationship with Jesus, that's his problem. My relationship with Jesus is mine. God bless.